of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. awesome God that we serve. Amen. Man, he is so worthy of all of our praise and to just be in his presence is so awesome, isn't it? Oh, man. There's a sweetness in the presence of the Lord. You know, here at CBC Northwest, we never say that the altar is open or closed or you can only come up and pray at a certain point in service. We just believe that that's why we're here is to worship the Lord in song, in word, in prayer, falling at our knees, and we just worship in this place. But this is the moment in service where we pause and we just invite folks that maybe, maybe you do want to come forward and you want to just kneel down or even just stand at the altar and bring something to the feet of Jesus. You might be dealing with something that happened this week or something that you've just been carrying on your mind for a period of time, and you're like, Lord, I just, I just need you right now. This is that moment, right? You know, I stand here right today, and even, even those of us that are on this side of the platform or stage and trying to speak encouragement to everyone, we go through things too, right? You know, I've shared with a lot of folks this, uh, had the eclipse on Monday, and that was real cool and everything, and then we went to bed on Monday night and woke up Tuesday morning. My wife's getting ready to leave for work, and she walks outside. She's like, where's the truck? And I was like, I don't know. Where's the truck? And somebody came and just took my truck. Just took it. And, you know, it's a tough pill to swallow because, you know, you hear of things like that happening to so many people, but when it happens to you, it's so much more real. And it's crazy because I guess I think back on it now and I laugh, but I called, you know, I made the police report and all that, and I called the number that they give you to check for updates, and I'm like, any updates? No, it's still actively stolen. It's okay. Well, look, is, is somebody looking for my truck? <laughs> you know, and I mean, I'm not saying, like, you need to go find Jason's truck. I'm like, you know, you've got homicide, you've got narcotics, you've got ice, you don't have, like, vehicle theft? They're like, no, pretty much, unless we, uh, unless we have a reason to run the plate. I mean, what? I'm like, so somebody, I want to make sure I understand. Somebody can take my truck, and they can go to the other side of town or whatever, wherever they go. They can drive it, and then if for some reason they obey all the laws and you have no reason to pull them over and run the plate, they got a free truck. I mean, am I saying that correctly? I mean, pretty much, unless we stumble upon it. I'm like, all right, well, all right, well what are you going to do? So I'm just praying that this will work out the way that it's supposed to work out because they stole my truck, but they didn't steal my joy. Isn't that what it said? rental car place gave me a convertible red Mustang. I told my wife, they stole my truck and my man car. I can't drive that car. I can't drive that car. You drive that car. I laugh, y'all, but you know what? We serve an awesome God, and, and when, when things, that, things happen to us that are bad, he takes those bad things and he makes them good. And so I, I know, I know, it hasn't happened yet, but I know that whatever the situation is, that wh whatever the reason is that this happened, God's going to take it and he's going to make something good out of it. So I give him praise and glory in advance for that. Amen. So I encourage you, if, if you're walking through something and whatever it may be, you know, just, man, have that attitude as well, right? It's hard to have, but have that attitude. God, whatever is happening right now, I know that you're going to take this and I know that you're going to make good out of it. Why? Because your word says it. And because I know that the battle is already won. And so I know that when the devil comes at me, when the devil comes at me and tries to do things to steal my joy or to break my faith or to bring me down, that all that does is make me holler, God, Jesus, hallelujah, even louder. And that makes him angry. Amen. So I'm out to make the devil angry. Amen. Father, we love you in this place. We honor you. We give you glory. We give you praise. And we thank you for the things that you're doing, you've done, and that you will do. 
We thank you, Father, that your word is true. We thank you that your mercies are new every day. We thank you, God, that you never fail and that your promises are true. So, Father, we lean on you in our times of trouble. We lean on you in our times of challenge. We lean on you, God, that whenever we're walking through something that just doesn't feel right, that, Lord, we remember that it's not about how we feel, Lord God, but it's about walking by faith and not by sight. And that's what we do in this place. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's continue to worship him.
Jesus is mine. He's been my footman in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, and what He
trust in God. He's my Savior, the one. He will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Never God, we don't only sing these words. We declare the truth in this message. So, Lord, thank you so much that we know that you will never fail us. Thank you, God, that you are all that you are to us. Thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you, God, that we can just worship you and just lift you up. And, God, we have the freedom to do that. <laughs> We love you so much, Father. We give you glory, God. We are so grateful for everything that you've done, that you're doing, and you're going to do. We're so grateful, Lord, to know you. So grateful that you call us your friend, that we can call you our friend, God. But, God, that you are our comforter, that you are our strength. Lord, we love you so much, and we just honor you in this place, God. And we ask you, Lord, that as we receive your word this morning, God, that you prepare our heart to receive it. God, may we never take for granted being in a position to receive your word. May it never just become a habit, Lord. May we come to you with a thirst and with a hunger and with an eagerness to receive from you every single time. Remove distractions from us, Lord, so that we can focus on you, God. We love you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see you today. Hey, we had a great picnic yesterday. I don't know whether, well, I don't think everybody in the room had, made it, but uh, a lot of you did. We had a good crowd, had a good time, good food, and uh, good fellowship. So uh, if you missed it, you know, don't, uh, don't dismay. We'll have another one hopefully in the, maybe in the fall or maybe even in the summer if it's not too hot. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to... Daniel chapter 4, Daniel is the book right before Psalm, if that helps you. Daniel chapter 4, and go ahead and take out your message notes. Between 630 and 562 B.C. lived one of the greatest kings in the Bible, and his name was Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he had everything a person really could ever dream of, especially a king. He had power. He had fame, he had money, um, and he was in the process, thank you, <laughs> he was in the process of building an empire for himself, and that empire would uh, memorialize him for, for forever, that be long after he was gone, people would remember him and remember how great he was. Uh, God used Nebuchadnezzar to shape world history, and like many rulers, he kind of reveled in his power and in his authority. He, he kind of thought he was all that, and he didn't give God much credit in what he had, for what he had. And in 586, Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian army attacked and destroyed Jerusalem, and they took all the treasure, took, took all the treasure, burned the temple, and then took thousands of the best and the brightest people back to, to Babylon with them. And you probably have heard this story before, but that's known as the what? Babylonian what? Exile, Babylonian exile. Now, out of the thousands of Jews that they took back and held captive, pa captive 
Uh, the Bible mentions four of them by name, and one of the names is a man named Daniel. Say Daniel. Daniel, Daniel yeah. And because of Daniel's uh, courage and character and integrity, well, he won favor really quick with King Nebuchadnezzar. And one, one night, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and that's where we'll pick up in the scriptures. Daniel chapter 4, and let's go to verse 10. You there, Sam, there? All right. This is Nebuchadnezzar, and he's talking to Daniel. Well, let, let me first say that after he had his dream, um, he took all of his magicians, all of his wise men and satraps and all those guys, and he said, hey, you know, what is this dream? Tell me my dream. They couldn't do it. So he, he called out for Daniel. Daniel came because the king knew that Daniel could interpret his dream for him. So this is the king talking to Daniel, and this is his dream that he had. He said, while I was laying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade, and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. And then I lay there dreaming. I saw a messenger a holy one, coming down from heaven. The messenger shouted, Cut down the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches. But, say but. But, but leave the stump. Say that with me. But leave the stump. Leave the stump and the roots in the ground, he said. Uh, bind it with a band of iron and bronze that will be surrounded by tender grass. Now, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field for seven periods of time. And we think that is seven years. Let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. So that was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And that was a dream that scared him absolutely to death. He didn't understand it. Um, but Daniel is fixing to tell him the, what the dream meant, and that's in uh, verse 22. <laughs> uh, verse 22, yeah, exactly. Verse 22. Here's what the dream meant, Daniel said. That tree, your majesty, is you, for you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to the heavens, and you rule to the ends of the earth. Then you saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down that tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and the roots. Say that with me. Leave the stump and the roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals of the field for seven periods of time or for seven years, we think. Seven years, probably. And in verse 24, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, what's going to happen? This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen to my lord, the king. Daniel always showed great respect for the king. You will be driven from hu human society, and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow, and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. In other words, you're going insane. You're going to go insane, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 26, but the stump and the roots of that tree were left in the ground. Now, Daniel's going to tell the king why exactly the stump has to stay in the ground and why they were going to wrap it with a band of iron. Verse 26, but the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. Here's what this means. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Advice: Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. I'm going to stop right there. So this dream was a prophecy over Nebuchadnezzar's life, that pretty soon his, his pride and his arrogance was going to completely come to an end, because we know that Nebuchadnezzar really never gave God any credit 
for everything he had. He never gave God credit for all the blessings that he had in raising him up to be a good king, a great king. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is going to give us three truths today, okay? And I want you to write these down. Three truths that we can get from the king's dream. Number one is that God is the Lord of what you have. God is the Lord of what you have. Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked king, a wicked king, powerful dictator. Uh, he was known by his ego. He was known for always building his wealth by conquering and killing the poor. And even though he was aware of and had seen the hand of God work through Daniel before, and even though he'd, he'd been told that the power and the glory he had as the king really came from God, even though he knew all that, he continued to just bask in the glory of his kingdom. Can you see him? Oh, the great king in his great palace on the, on the roof, you know, with his lounge chair and his cup of tea and a little umbrella and somebody there to fan him. The great king, Nebuchadnezzar, continued to bask in his glory. And you know, like many of us, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a really short-term memory. Very short-term memory when it came to the blessings of God. And then, after all Daniel had told him, watch this, okay, verse 29. It's unbelievable. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. Now, nothing had happened, okay? Twelve months later, Nebuchadnezzar was still king, everything was great, all the blessings of God were still on him. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk, and as he looked out across the city, he said, Oh, look at this great city of Babylon. By my what? What does it say? By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal resident to display my majestic splendor. And while these words, get this, while these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. Don't you love that? Turn to your neighbor and say, I really love that. And I don't want to have a short-term memory. Go ahead and say it to him. I, I want a long-term memory. Can you believe that? I mean, a year prior, he virtually, you know, Daniel said that God said, you know, he was going to go crazy. He was going to live in the wild. He was going to walk around like the beasts of the, of the field. And I mean, it, don't you think that that would have gotten his attention? But it didn't. Short term memory. And just like Dan, or just what Daniel told him would happen, happened. And he was driven from society. Now, imagine for a second, if you will, no human contact for years. No human contact. Seven years. He was in the wild. He ate grass like an animal. He, he got, had to get on all fours to drink like an animal. Uh, didn't bathe, didn't shave. His hair was probably completely matted, maybe something like dreadlocks. I don't know. I didn't know that he had dreadlocks back then. Um, he was dirty. He was filthy. He had rotting teeth. And the Bible says that his nails were so long that they had turned downward like bird claws. And not to forget, he was completely insane. That's the old great king, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar stole God's glory. In essence, that's exactly what he did. He stole the glory that was due to God. Thankfulness? He didn't have any. None whatsoever. Gratitude? He had none. Humility? Uh-uh. Not there. He was so wrapped up in himself, he couldn't see where his blessings were coming from. He stole God's glory, and he kept it for himself. Question. Have you ever done that? I have. Turn to your neighbor and say, have you ever done that? Oh, and by the way, tell your neighbor, you smell really good this morning. <laughs> and I can tell you've been working out. Amen. Yeah.
Did you know that just like Nebuchadnezzar, whatever you have today, right now, this minute, came from God? And he is the Lord over what you have. That all of that's right. Give him a hand. That every single thing that you have came from his wonderful hands. Your family, your children, your health, your intellect, your good looks, your job, your money. It's all from him because of his goodness. And today, you know, perhaps you'd agree to that, but you can't help but something kind of deep down in your in your spirit says, you know what? Maybe you're giving him a little too much credit, Carl. Maybe you're giving him a little too much credit. You know, maybe you think, hey, I've worked hard all my life. Yes, I've got a lot of blessings right now. Things are good. But I've worked really hard for it. You know, I, work, I had two jobs to raise my kids. I put myself through school. You know, I really sacrificed where I am to get where I am today. And, you know, that may be true, but there's one who gave you the wherewithal, the energy, and the health, and the bandwidth to do that. Amen? And it's God. And he is Lord over what you have. God's sovereign, isn't he? God is the supreme authority and in total control of what you have and what I have. Everything good comes from God. Everything. James 1.17 tells us, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in heaven, and he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. God is the Lord of what you have. Say that with me. One, two, three. God is the Lord of what I have. And just as important as that, God is the Lord of what you've lost. God's the Lord of what you've lost. You know, life was, it was really good for Nebuchadnezzar. He had more than he needed. You know, he had armies at his disposal, hundreds of servants, riches beyond imagination. And when he heard those words come out of Daniel's mouth, your majesty, you are this tree. It must have been like a gut punch for him. Or at least it was for that day, right? After 12 months, he kind of forgot about it. But there's not, probably not anyone in here that hasn't lost something or lost somebody that's near and dear to your heart, whether it was a, a, a spouse or a friend or a loved one, child. Probably no one in this room that hasn't gone through a loss. You know, maybe you, you've lost money because of bad decisions or, or maybe it's by nothing you've done. You know, your life just kind of took a turn, and you're wondering what, what in the world is going on. But I want to tell you today that God is the Lord of what you've lost. You know, no matter whether it's your business, whether it's your family, whether it's your health, whether it's your courage, maybe your self-esteem, nothing slips through God's hands. Nothing slips through God's hands without him knowing about it. Doesn't that make you feel better? I mean, just knowing that, that everything that happens to you goes through God's hands. Because God is the Lord of what you have, and he's the Lord of what you've lost. And the third truth we get from our story, and if you don't get anything else today, if, if I have put you to sleep already, I want you to wake up, okay? Wake up. All right? If you don't get anything else, I want you to get this. God is the Lord of what we have. He's the Lord of what we've lost. And he's the Lord of what remains. He's the Lord of what you got left. Look again at what Daniel says in verse 23. No, there's no slide here. Cut down the tree and destroy it. But leave the stump and the roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. In other words, God's saying, hey, your success and your prosperity, they're going to be cut off. But I'm going to leave you something, Nebuchadnezzar, because I'm the God of what's left. I'm the God of what 
remains. I'm going to leave you a stump, Nebuchadnezzar, because one day when you wake up, I'm going to bring you back to that stump, and we're going to get going again in your life. God is the Lord of what remains. Amen? You know, the devil <clears throat> is continually trying to steal what God has given us. Do you agree with that? Have you experienced that? But we have to remember something, and that, that is God is the Lord, not only of what he's given you, not only of what you've lost, but he's telling you right now, and he's telling me right now, today, right here, I'm the Lord of what you have, I'm the Lord of what you've lost, and I'm the Lord of what remains. Turn to your neighbor and say, he is the Lord of what remains. Now turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and say it, and say it to them. God is the Lord of what remains. <laughs> God is never going to allow the enemy to steal something from you without leaving something behind. He's always going to give you a stump. Now turn to your neighbor and say, I got a stump. I got a stump. I got a stump. Just call me Stumpy. Stumpy. <laughs> if God allows you to lose everything, then his thought is either you don't need it anyway, and you don't need it to fulfill my purpose. For you on earth. You know, sometimes, sometimes, and maybe you've wondered this, but I got a lot of stuff. You? You got a lot of stuff. And I wonder sometimes, would I be okay if I didn't have this stuff? You know? And I want to say yes. I want to say, of course, I'd be, that's my holy answer. But deep down, would we be okay? I hope so. I hope so. God is the Lord of what remains. And he's here to tell you today that you are not the Lord of your life. That he's the Lord of your life. He is the one who provides for you. He, his name is Jehovah Jireh. And he's your provider. <laughs> and nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing is too difficult for him. You know, it all comes from him. God removed the wickedness from the world in the flood, right? But he always left something behind. Remember, what did he leave behind in the flood? He left eight people. He left eight people to repopulate the earth because he's the God of what remains. And he took those eight people, and here we are today. It's a wonderful life, isn't it? Why? Because God is the God of what we have, the God of what we've lost, and the God of what remains. A man named Job. You can turn there, the book of Job. Job was a man of integrity. He feared God. Uh, he stayed away from evil. He had seven sons, three daughters, uh, 7,000 sheep. Um, 3,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, 500 donkeys, which back then means that you were, I mean, you, you really had it. You were, you were in there. He had all that, and he had servants as well. Job was blessed by God, would you say? Yeah, he was, big time. Now, Job, go to chapter 1 of Job, uh, verse 6, or excuse me, verse, yeah, verse 6, and we'll go to 7. <clears throat> and I just want you to get this part real quick because this just kind of gives me chills. One day, members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered to the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's been going on. I don't know about you, but that, that gives me 
So he be Jeebies. God's having a heavenly staff meeting, okay? And he only talks about this kind of stuff in a couple of places in the Bible, and this is one of them. God's having a heavenly staff meeting, right? He's got all the angels, and then Satan shows up. Now, if you know Satan, he's the, he's the one that um, he, wanted, he, he, he didn't want to be under God. Let me say it that way. He got tired of worshiping God, and he wanted to be his own God. You know, he wanted to run the show. You've ever wanted to run the show? Yeah, okay. So, you know, when you think about it, <clears throat> whenever we try to run our own life, and whenever we try to call the shots, we're kind of agreeing with Satan, aren't we? Wow. That hurt. But doesn't that just unnerve you a little bit to know that Satan right now could be interrupting a heavenly staff meeting? God says, hey, where have you been? Well, I've been around in San Antonio watching CBC Northwest, watching these people, that person, that person, to see who I can destroy. Now, we don't need to be scared because of that, because we know that God's in control. But I'll tell you what, when I read this this week, again, read it before, every time I read it, it just opens my eyes, and it makes me realize that, dude, <clears throat> there's a war going on. There's a war going on, and we have to be ready for it. And it's not us that's going to win the war, but it's the Holy Spirit and the power of God through us that's going to win that war. Anyway, <clears throat> Satan said this to God after he interrupted the staff meeting. He said, hey, the only reason that Job serves you is because you blessed him so much. Only reason. You've blessed him. You've protected him. Why don't you let me take all that away and let's see if he still worships you. God said, okay, you can take everything he has. Just don't hurt him physically. All right. We know the story. Why did, why did God say that? Why did God say, hey, take everything he has, but don't hurt him? Because God always leaves something behind. Satan attacks Job, and he kills all of his oxen, all of his sheep, all his servants, all of his sheep. I said that. Worst of all, killed all his children. All within a matter of minutes. Go through Job and read that again. All within a matter of minutes. But you know what? Job, Job knew where to turn, didn't he? Job knew where to turn when his life was falling <clears throat> apart. He turned to God. In uh, chapter 1, verse 20, let's read. After all this happened, remember, it just happened within a minute. It was, there was like three messengers that came to him in a matter of minutes and said, hey, this just happened. Hey, this just happened. And the last one was, hey, your, your house fell in and it killed all your children. And Job stood up and he tore his robe in grief. And then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise be. Praise be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. So Satan comes back, and he says, okay, God. He, he passed the first test. Now, now let, me, uh, let me make him sick. Let's see what he does. If I make him sick, I just know that he'll come back and he'll curse you to your face, Satan said to God. God said, okay, you can ruin his body, take away his health, but you can't kill him. Why? Because God will always leave you something. God will always leave you a stump. That's what you have left. And God said, you can, you can do all that to him, but don't kill him because I've got a plan for his life. Because one day, in uh, 2000, I almost said 14, 2024, what's today? 
April 14, 2024, God said, hey, Job, I got something left for you here. Satan, you can't destroy him because one day, April 14, Carl's going to be able to read the scriptures. You guys are going to be able to read the scriptures, and you're going to know that God will always leave you something. God knew. He knew you'd be here today. You're not here by accident. Now, I'm glad you're here, by the way. So let me ask you. You got anything left? You know? Got anything left this morning? You have anything left from this week? I know Satan stole a bunch, no doubt. But you got anything left? You got any faith left? You got any courage left? How about hope? You got hope left? If you don't have anything else left, you got a stump. You got a stump. See, I got a stump. You know, Job, Job's losses, I want to say were painful, but I don't think any of us could even imagine how painful they really were. But what God left was so powerful. What did Job have left after he lost everything? After he lost his wealth, his health, and his family. The only thing that Job had left was his confidence and faith in God. That's all he had left. And that's what made him say, though he slay me, I will yet trust him. Though he slay me, though he kill me, though he take everything away from me, I will still praise him. You know, I hope that I would say that. Some days I'm not sure. We can hope. Our God is the Lord of what remains. He's too good to drop you. He's too kind to leave you. And he's more than powerful enough to use what you have left after last week. He'll take it. He'll use it. And he'll make something good out of it. So you got anything left? Got anything left today? Why not give it to God? Give it to God. Because <clears throat> whatever you have left, God wants to use in your purpose in this, in this life. He wants you to use it and minister to other people. You know, God doesn't always bless you, or he doesn't bless you just so you can get fat and happy. Right? I mean, if, if you just get all the blessing, 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 you just kind of, you know, fill up like a big tick. You know, and you know what happens with big, fat ticks, right? They get crushed. And they splatter everywhere. And if you, don't, you and I don't give away the, all the blessings that God gives us, we're no good. I mean, he's going to dry them up. I guarantee you. He'll dry them up. Just like he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He'll dry them up until we recognize the fact that he's God and I'm not. He's the one who's going to deliver us from the evil one. What do you have left? But Carl, I've made so many mistakes in life. I have so many regrets. Regrets. I've let so many people down. Well, God's saying, okay, well, I'm the God of what you've lost, so what you got left? And I'll use whatever it is. Now, if you don't know, Job's story had a happy ending, and I encourage you to go through it and read the entire chapter. You can do it in probably, I mean, it took, took me like 45 minutes, and I'm a slow reader. But go through it. It's got a great happy ending. God restores everything back to him. Times two. Great story. God's the Lord of what we have. He's the Lord of what we've lost. And he's the Lord of what remains. Aren't you glad? All right, let's pray.
Lord, we thank you because we know that you work all things together for, for the good, for those who love and trust you. And Lord, we just want to declare today that we do love and we do trust you. And Father, thank you for the great truths and the great examples that you've given us through your word with King Nebuchadnezzar and, and Job. And Lord, help us to remember every day that, that you're the one who's in charge. And Lord, when we want to take the reins and put you on the shelf, would you remind us about Nebuchadnezzar? Would you remind us about Job and how you always left something in their lives that you could come back to and work with? Thank you for being a loving Heavenly Father. And Lord, thank you for never taking it all. Lord, help us to have loose hands that when, when our hands are open and you fill them with blessings, Lord, help us not to grip those blessings tight. Lord, help us have open hands so that we can give those blessings away to other people. If you're here today and, you know, maybe <clears throat> you're a believer and you'd say, you know, Carl, I've been kind of I've been kind of running my own life lately. It's been a little while since I've fellowshiped with God. I've been calling the shots and quite frankly, things were going well for a little while, but now they're not so going so good. If that's you, would you commit today to giving the reins back to God and letting him steer your wagon? again just commit that to him right now father we commit that to you we give that to you lord and, and we want to make a declaration today that we realize that that you're god and we're not you're in control and we're not so lord we relinquish control of our life right now to you and lord we repent of putting ourselves above you in our heart. We repent, Lord, of stealing your glory, the glory that was meant for you. Forgive us, Lord. If you're here today and, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'll say again that God knew you'd be here today. And he knew that he, I'm gonna, I was going to pray this prayer here. I'm going to pray in a second. And he's calling you. He called you here. He arranged for you to be here if you don't know him as your Savior. That's what he wants today. Because he loves you. And he died for you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Not religion. It's not religion. But it's a relationship. So if you want to accept Christ... Would you just repeat this prayer after me? <clears throat> Dear Jesus, this morning I trust you. I accept your forgiveness for all of my sin. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to read your word and do what it says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I believe that someone rededicated their life. Someone took God off the shelf this morning and someone said, God, I'm giving you my life back. I believe that someone did that today. And I also believe that someone gave their heart to Jesus today. So would you help me celebrate that? God is a good God. And if that was you, if you gave your heart to Jesus this morning, would you please grab your, uh, your bulletin and uh, tear off that response card? And fill your name out and your phone number. You can give us as much information as you want. Um, but just your name and phone number would do. Check the box at the bottom that says, I accepted Christ today. Um, I will call you this week, text you, however I can get a hold of you. And uh, just congratulate you and, uh, and let you know that we love you. And hopefully you'll come back and we'll see you again. But if you never, never come back and we never see you again, we just want you to know that today is your day of salvation. And you need, to, you need to take that and grip it tight and find a good Bible-believing church. Amen? 
All right. And this is a Bible-believing church, so we'd love to have you. And if you accepted Christ as your Savior and you're online, would you do the same thing? Would you just text me, hey, I accepted Christ today. My name is so-and-so, and I'll have your phone number, and I will text you back and call you next week um, for the same reason, just to encourage you and to uh, let you know how, how much we want to help you in any way we can. Amen. Amen. Hey, I've got, I've got quite a few really important announcements. Um, would you turn to your neighbor and say, here comes some really important announcements? Really important announcements. Boy, I want to celebrate what you guys did last week. <clears throat> you know, we've talked about, if you weren't here, we've talked about the fact that um, our, the, tab the round tables that we've had, we have um, are ancient. Um, they were given to us, which is awesome, and we're thankful for them. But, you know, it's a new season, and uh, we, we really need some new tables. The tables that we have are made out of uh, uh, wood, and they weigh a lot. They really weigh a lot. We have them stored in the back um, against the wall, and I am, we have cones in front of them. I'm always nervous that one of them's going to fall over and hurt somebody. Um, so we've been praying that that wouldn't happen. But it's all we have. So we talked about last week the fact that we do need some tables. We need some round tables. We need some rectangle tables. And we also need some folding chairs. And I just want to celebrate what you guys did last, last week by your giving. Here's what you did. How do you like that? Is God good? God is good. Now, if you weren't here or if you were not in on that blessing last week, I want to give you an opportunity to be in on the blessing this week, okay? Because it is a blessing to give, isn't it? Remember how we, we need to have open hands and continue to give those blessings back? Well, we, we're going to order these tables. We're going to have them before, uh, by, by the end of April. We need, you know, need some more of these, and we definitely need some chairs. But you know what? I'm trusting God that he's going to do it, and he'll do it through you, and I believe that. And online, um, you are also included in this, um, and someday when you come to church, you can sit at these new tables, and, uh, and we'll love on you a little bit. All right, so that's a good news, isn't it? That's some good news. So if you'd like to um, buy a table, they're about $150. And so, you know, you can think of it this way. Hey, I want to buy a table, you know, or I want to buy a half a table. I want to buy two legs of a table, okay? <laughs> How, whatever you can do will be wonderful, okay? No pressure whatsoever. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, Men's Life Group meets next week at April 20th at 9 a.m. Hey, and this is really, really big. It's important, and I don't know whether I have an insert or not. Does somebody have a ladies' brunch insert that I could have just for a second? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we're going to have a, a great ladies' brunch on April 27th. If you're a lady, would you hold this up if you have one? And if you do not have one, just raise your hand, okay, and we'll give you one. I noticed that all the bulletins may have not gotten filled. There's one in the back um, and one over here. Awesome. Um, we've got a lady <clears throat> named um, Deneen Goki, I, I believe. Deneen is a women's pastor over at CBC, the, the big one over there that's just so far away. You never want to drive over there. Uh, and if you do, you're going to have to get a hotel because it's just, you know, you can't do it but, uh, two times. A joke. And, you know, we used to be part of that CBC over there. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Um, in 06, we started as a satellite. And uh, since then, after about five years, we got our own 501c3, and we have, we have separated from them, not, not because we don't love them and they don't love us, but, you know, God, I mean, we start, you start a satellite with the idea that someday it's going to be a church plant, and that's what we are. We're, we're all plants, you know. Um, so uh, she's going to come, the women's pastor of CBC, great ladies. She's got a great word for you, and I know that you won't want to miss it, ladies. So. 
We need to know if you're coming. So if you would take this, turn it over, give us your name uh, or phone number and an email if you would. And we're going to provide child care for you, for, for the little ones. Uh, so if you, if you have that need, let us know. Check that child care. And then give us the names and ages of your children. All right? And how many? How many you have? All right? This is going to be great, ladies. I encourage you not to miss it. Uh, all right. I think, uh, I think that's, that's all the, the real important ones. Um, there's a lot of other information in your bulletin. That's, it's also important. Um, but we've run out of time. So if you would stand with me. God is so good, and so are you. All right? So I want to dismiss you and say the Lord loves you, um, and I pray that he'll keep you and make his face to shine upon you. I'm still working on this. Make his face to shine upon you and give you peace all week. All right? God bless you.